Naples, Italy. Capella San Severo. An interesting Rococo statue abides here, supposedly made by the 18th century sculptor Francesco Querolo. Art historians assure us that this masterpiece was carved using uh, manual tools and techniques out of a single piece of marble. Now marble is a relatively very soft stone and it's got those uh, kind of uh, veins in it that are so fragile that this uh, net would be a miracle that it survives even without anything hitting it for centuries. And so the art historians, to make their story more believable, assure us that the artist was uh, rubbing it with uh, pumice stone to carve this net. Because obviously by hitting it with a chisel, it would break in no time, probably with the very first hit. Well, I happen to have about uh, marble and pumice at home, so I quickly conducted an experiment. I tried to carve something, anything, or even a scratch into the marble with the help of a pumice and the results were much faster than I expected. The pumice wore out in no time. There were no visible scratches on the marble itself. So the pumice story I don't believe, but uh, let's uh, assume that um, the sculptor was rubbing it with some harder stone. Actually, that wouldn't make much uh, difference at all, because no matter with what you rub it, the point is, once you start applying pressure in any form, by hitting it with a chisel or by rubbing it with anything, it is gonna break, it's marble. And not only that, the net has got few layers. If the work was done, and it is a really fine work, really with uh, manual tools, how would the, the sculptor make the inner layers those are carved as well. Uh, in some cases he wouldn't have a place to access the inside of this uh, net, what to speak of, uh, you know, working around with tools and stuff. I shared my doubts in the forms of a question w with uh, actually 15 art experts, art historians, and asked them what they think about this. Of course, most of them simply avoided the question. Two of them uh, did reply, but their information was uh, not to the point, not really relevant to the question. And when I tried to press them uh, further, pinpointing the exact uh, problem, marble breaks, you can't hit it, you can't rub it without putting pressure on it. Finally, he just said, I mean, why would you expect that we know each and everything? Such an expectations of yours are by themselves unreasonable. Well, they would be unreasonable indeed if they were honest and were openly admitting that there are lots of white spots in the history of art, instead of dishonestly pretending that they have figured out everything and we know all about the techniques used a few centuries ago, supposedly. In other words, I'm asking if the history of art, or at least some parts of it, was created to really inform us about what techniques, for example, were used in the past, or was it created to partially endorse the false history of humanity with false history of art? In the gold collection of the Hermitage Museum, some of the items cannot be even viewed with simple eyesight. That is why they are placed behind big magnifying glasses. Some of them would need even two magnifying glasses behind one another to view the actual details. The most famous and most skillful jewels on the planet have been attempting to make copies, for example, of uh, these famous earrings called Fyodosovsky Sergi, and all of them have failed completely. Even the world-famous maker of the Fabergé eggs, Peter Karl Fabergé, even he failed utterly and completely. What you see on the screen now are his uh, famous uh, masterpieces. So, even after this uh, failure, still the textbooks continue to assure us that such a fine gold work, for example, like the one of uh, the Scythians, which were surely connected with the culture of the survivors, 
is a work of barely civilized people who could not unable to organize themselves within a country or anything like that and constantly traveling with their cattle in the search of uh, lush uh, grass for their cattle. And that's all basically the way they picture it, just a nomadic hut and simple people. Then how could they produce these things that we cannot uh, replicate? This this is such a fine city and uh, work. It is seen only under magnifying glass. And now this is a really very recent finding of uh, Nikolai Subotiv in the area of Arkaim. These are quartzite stones, something like a star with six rays or something like that. Quartzite by itself is a very hard stone and how did they shape it by itself is quite a question, but the most mysterious are these holes in them. Now, drill holes are nothing new on the megaliths all around the world, but these are not even around, so it wasn't some rotating uh, drill. How did they make it? Moreover, these uh, uh, holes are quite deep and uh, their sides are very, very smooth. With our current technology, the only way we could produce this is with laser. So interesting, how did they do it and or maybe they knew the recipe of uh, quartzite geopolymer as well? Ukraine, Crimea, Palace Vorontsovsky. The entire palace complex is made out of diabase stone. Diabase is particularly hard variety of stone. For example, in the Aswan quarries in Egypt, few diabase stones are left for the tourists, the enthusiastic tourists who wish to try for themselves how does it feel to try to work with a granite using another stone. Now you can imagine how easy would it be to handle this diabase stone with uh, just uh, simple tools, the one we are told the builders had. The official history tells us that this palace was built 200 years ago by simple villagers, locals, and of course, conveniently failed to provide a demonstration how could this happen in reality. Yes, really, a demonstration would be the most interesting thing. It will be interesting to find out how many months or years would take a worker to prepare one of the stones, if that is possible at all. this statue in uh, this palace, it is as if alive. Actually, it doesn't look anything special from far away, and only when you are told to get near and see the details, then you understand what is the miracle about it. Amazing uh, details are seen there, like for example the stitches on its dress, or the individual fibers or threads out of which its uh, dress has been made. It doesn't make much sense. Why would uh, one go such in detail, also in the places where it is not visible? Supposedly made by an artist uh, about whom we know almost nothing, Quintilio Corbellini. He must have been a great genius and yet no information about him. Can somebody reproduce this nowadays using uh, just uh, simple manual tools? I doubt it. Or maybe his uh, 
sons and grandsons and I don't know how many generations ahead will need to finish it. We can make this uh, nowadays only with a 3D printer and also we would need the 3D scanner, a quality, a very high quality one. While the Corbellini character was producing them, I mean like on a production line, it's not only this one, another one almost identical was uh, sold on an auction in London. Both are very similar, but it seems when they were scanning the girl with that scanner, it uh, just uh, moved within a few minutes or something, and there is a slight uh, difference in the folds of her dress, and also a few of her hairs have moved a bit. On this image you see the comparison between the girl from the uh, Palace Voronets and the one sold in the Bonhams auction in London. Well, I find it increasingly difficult uh, to believe just any art uh, historian. I think they should be first asked to replicate the work that they are commenting on, and then they can be considered an authority on it. And by the way, I am not at all highly impressed by the so-called art created by these very same modern art historians who are much more advanced than their historic counterparts. I am neither impressed by the fineness of their so-called art, neither by its so-called message, if there is any message at all in this. Last cities that honored the gods of the survivors and were still built with uh, techniques inherited from them, they all had triumphal arches, and many of them are still there. This collection of triumphal arches from all around the world is uh, compiled by Mikhail Volk. Probably very few would uh, guess uh, that uh, there could be technology employed in these uh, arcs that we could not uh, replicate nowadays, but it turns out uh, we are so pathetic we cannot uh, replicate even a relatively small thing like this. Now in Moscow they try to replicate some parts of uh, the Ark for the purpose of uh, repair, but uh, they had uh, to just uh, make the project smaller and make the art with the new Ark without certain elements. And during the uh, inauguration ceremony of the new Ark, some journalists were quite persistent and actually a very valuable piece of information leaked out of uh, some of the people who participated in the project of the renovation of the Ark. It turned out that um, we cannot replicate this arc because there is um, a large cast iron monument on the top of it. When they tried to cast new parts to substitute some of the old ones, it came out that the full thing is too heavy and the arch won't be able to support it. And then, of course, the question came up, but then how come the arch is supporting this composition, the old one? It is also made of cast iron. And then the sad truth transpired that actually we are unable to make statues of such quality. When we cast, cast iron, it is uh, always very thick and the full thing appear, uh, ends up very heavy, while in the past they knew how to make it very thin. Uh, they calculated and it seems that the thickness of the original uh, monument is some one centimeter, and we cannot reproduce that. So these uh, persistent journalists, uh, they were uh, pressing hard on some of the participants of the restoration project, and uh, this is how much they could uh, get out of them. Those specialists said, well, the old statue was made of cast iron of some special recipe, some old recipe that is now lost. Recipe is lost? I really don't believe this. Supposedly this ark was built some 200 years ago. If they are telling me that, uh, for example, an ancient uh, recipe has been lost about the um, formulas that they were giving to their domestic baby griffins 84,000 years ago, that I can believe. 
but casting iron, this tradition hasn't been broken during the last long 200 years. Or at least it shouldn't be forgotten in a natural way, unless artificial circumstances were created and uh, people adopted uh, a low quality uh, cast iron. There must have been some special reason for uh, such a downgrade. And also finding out uh, the exact formula of a particular piece of uh, cast uh, iron is a very common procedure that would uh, that uh, usually takes some uh, 20 minutes. It is used all the time in uh, the uh, places where cast iron is uh, being worked with. There is nothing complex about it. Are they trying to convince us that uh, nobody, it, it didn't strike anybody to perform such a quick and easy test? Most likely they did easily find out the compos composition of the old cast iron, but uh, didn't want to make it, uh, uh, you know, like public so people don't start uh, using advanced technologies. But why they didn't use it uh, themselves? even only if, uh, for the purpose of restoration only. Well, either there were some uh, very rare or m maybe even not earthly elements uh, in it. That's one not likely, but also a possibility. Another possibility is that after finding the actual uh, formula, everything was uh, just uh, frozen and made uh, secret so that uh, people can't get advantage of a better technology. And yet another possibility is uh, they found out the formula, but it is not just a question of a formula. You need the actual casting technique, uh, technique and equipment. Or maybe a fourth possibility that I cannot uh, think about at the moment. But in any case, the sad truth is that just a few hundred years ago, still the last uh, remnants of the knowledge of the survivors was uh, taken and is being taken away from us in a broad daylight. This is what we call a great achievement, the first anthropomorphic design and so on, our first advanced diving suit. Or at least we're supposed to think that it was advanced for the times that it appeared, some 130 years ago. Just compare it with the quality of the knight's armor that was created a century before that. The superiority of the quality of the old stuff is visible even to non-professionals at once. This is what the encyclopedia of every good ship tells us about the dawn of steel working. And yet, decades before that, the impressive buildings of the St. Isaac's Cathedral and the palace, which now houses the Hermitage Museum in St. Petersburg, are uh, built with uh, absolutely amazing and strong steel frames. Just uh, look at this uh, construction. It is uh, obviously a professionally made uh, product by people who have uh, tradition and a knowledge in steel working. And I wonder why the stainless steel I buy in the shop gets rusty very quickly nowadays. Well, not all, but at least the one made in China surely does. This uh, steel work is of high professional quality, and yet it appears in a country which at that time was extremely backwards, accor according to mainstream history, and anyway, this technology should not have existed. And this was decades ago, uh, ago according to mainstream history, most likely, actually, these buildings were there long before that. 
and more research from Alexei Kungurov. He will be one of uh, the main characters after a few episodes. Probably his discoveries will be the most shocking out of all new things that you will hear in the Survivor series. But at this point, he is just uh, turning our attention about this uh, to, to these triangular structures which are used in mapping. Maps need to be anchored, so to say, to some real points on the ground from where the uh, calculations and the map grid would begin. And uh, he started uh, finding very ancient uh, looking structures of this sort. And then he even found uh, photos, very old photos, dating at the time when this system supposedly didn't even exist. The level of radiation in uh, Moscow city is far above average. Many blame it on nuclear wastes. According to other sources, uh, that is all cleaned up now. But if we believe this uh, map of uh, the radiation contamination, if the map is correct, it seems to form kind of a round and the center is right in the middle of the city. Many people automatically assume that the cause for this contamination could be only some very recent activity because the mass media is uh, leading us to believe that nuclear weapons are only a very recent discovery. But other possibilities exist as well. If we read the stories of the mainstream uh, history, we hear about uh, Napoleon invading, uh, trying to invade uh, Russia. And after the Russians held a few victories over the army of Napoleon, they suddenly decide to just uh, uh, withdraw and uh, furthermore leave their capital absolutely vacant for Napoleon to just come in. That was the order given by the field uh, marshal to just run away and leave the capital without any uh, battle. And uh, despite everybody's uh, protests, because it was obviously stupid, that was the situation. And after that, the strange and illogical things continue. Some sort of uh, grand fire devastates uh, Moscow in a very mysterious way. Of course, nobody has uh, invested interest in this fire and officially the reasons and the cause is not yet sure. And the cartoon continues afterwards, although Napoleon went uh, to war to conquer uh, Russia and Moscow, he was given it for free and then he ran away, although he had it without any battle or anything. But as usual, the best way to spot lies and liars is when they get inconsistent and start contradicting it themselves. For example, this fire turned uh, especially the center of Moscow into just uh, rubble. How can a fire turn uh, huge stone buildings into rubble? This doesn't happen. The skeleton remains when actual fires occur. And also in the concise version of this history, like for example the one in the school books, they provide an easy explanation, well it was all wooden and so it burned, but when you read the detailed version you understand that it has nothing to do with the concise, the very center, because the fire was exactly circular, by the way, the very center was uh, the main Kremlin, the very center of the city where wood construction was not allowed for a long time already before the fire due to fire hazards exactly and indeed the very name of the city of, at that time and also it transpires from the paintings of the artists who painted whatever they saw was uh, Moscow made of white stone it's like a phrase what uh, has remained left uh, from this uh, white stone Moscow this is when they dig the streets for a canal, for example, we get a glimpse uh, there is a layer of white stone. Some claim to have tested it and uh, verified that it is actually geopolymer. But in any case, 
this was not an ordinary fire and um, there are diaries and other documents left from the witnesses at that time well listen to what they say this is from the diary of a french officer of the napoleon army at that time meaning the time when the fire exploded uh, we happened to be in Kremlin and our room had a panorama to the full city. We were awakened by a very strange light that illuminated the full city. Light of ball descended and first it illuminated the graceful and noble, I'm translating, um, outlines of the buildings. And then the palace simply fell apart and collapsed. Well, this is an unusual fire, I must say. The image that you see now is an actual photo from uh, nuclear tests. So, it really looks like an accurate description of some sort of weapon of this type. Now, this is not the only witness account of this uh, type. It was uh, discovered in year 2010 and again uh, woke up this question again in the circles of Russia, but uh, there were doubts about it even before. Uh, this was from the diary of Philippe de Segur, found in year 2010 in Paris. Well, as the story uh, continues according to these uh, diaries and according to uh, mainstream history as well, is uh, the army of uh, Napoleon doesn't want to enjoy its uh, victory that got, uh, uh, you know, without reason and they head back. But how do they head back? All of a sudden, sicknesses start after the fire. People, I mean, even the officers call them just the devilish, they don't understand them. First of all, most of the people die straight away, and the small, the small portion that survives suffer terrible blood, diarrhea, extreme weakness. Feeling barely alive, their hair and nails fall off and so on everything is absolutely consistent with the typical aftermath of a nuclear weapon or something very similar to it and by the way this so-called fire had an amazingly circular shape it's a devastation uh, area and originated exactly in uh, the stone kremlin and amazingly enough could spread through ditches that uh, at places are 34 meters wide these are earth trenches around the Kremlin and 13 meters deep an ordinary fire shouldn't be able to cross that and interestingly enough after the fire these uh, ditches stopped existing they were full of rubble just imagine the scale of this explosion Ordinary fires don't uh, shift stones in such quantity. If indeed Moscow was uh, bombed by nuclear weapon or something of that sort at that time, then who did it? Well, there are so many parties out there in the rich ecosystem of the universe that uh, temper with uh, the history of human race I don't know which one of them exactly could have done it, but I guess it, uh, I guess it wasn't a very uh, benevolent and kind one, because kind entities don't kill in such manner. As far as we can judge from the diaries of the actual people on the ground, none of them had any clue who did it. And uh, most of them seem to have been thinking that it was the other party that they are uh, the party that they are fighting is causing this to them, which is uh, very normal because um, in order to organize uh, normal humans to go to war, there is a need to convince them that uh, this has some sort of uh, local reasons. Like, for example, at this uh, very moment, a war is going on in uh, Syria and in uh, most of the mass uh, media outlets, it is always presented as some sort of local problem. And most people are indeed, conv indeed convinced that uh, wars are fought for uh, resources. What resources? Who has won any resources out of the so many recent wars we have seen with our own eyes? Full countries are trashed, 
like uh, I mean uh, Libya, uh, Iraq, just total destruction. Did anybody get any resource benefit out of that? For example, like the American people who uh, pay heavy taxes to fund all this? In the same way the actual parties on the ground during the war uh, with uh, Napoleon, they had some sort of uh, their own ideas of uh, why and what uh, they are fighting for. And a third party uh, took advantage of the convenient for uh, them situation of uh, 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 military action going on and uh, dumped the bomb to serve their own purposes. Now, the Russian field marshal who actually ordered the evacuation of Moscow could have had some information that something will be happening and that's why he might have issued this highly controversial evacuation order. And then the Kremlin, as we know, it uh, was uh, rebuilt now with uh, a lower quality and lower technology because uh, the closer we get in the timeline, the more we lose the knowledge of the survivors and pay attention to the pieces that were reused in the construction of Kremlin. These are the white stone uh, pieces with uh, leaves and other ornaments, survivor style art, probably on a geopolymer. And also on this image you see a Romaic style column, remains of a column, top maybe. And still textbooks assure the um, innocent uh, children that actually th this, uh, this is some sort of uh, art that originated in Europe and the people in those area didn't know anything about it at that time. In rare cases, few white stones still remain in the foundations of some older buildings. And while digging for uh, f building foundations, this uh, Romaic style objects surface now and then. And we also see interesting stuff on the paintings of the city before it was uh, demolished by this explosion. Like, for example, the roofs are often covered with metal plates. We do use a lot that nowadays because uh, we have uh, actual sophisticated uh, machinery to produce them. But such a production would have been impossible with the level of technology that we are led to believe existed at that time, according to our textbooks. The artifacts show a developed industry, actually, a few centuries ago in uh, Russia, while we are being told that it was a backwards uh, country without any question of technology, even yet the artifacts show something completely different. Uh, you remember in St. Uh, Petersburg, the St. Isaac's Cathedral that probably we, can, we still cannot replicate and it's um, still a uh, frame. And the authentic outfits of the people of that era did not show any signs of poverty. No, they dressed like queens and kings, not like beggars. And whatever building elements could not be destroyed by fires and other uh, calamities in the history, the modern day the restoration teams, they complete that job. This is how they mask uh, whatever survival star style art is left. Well, in this particular case, they have left a small window uh, where one can get a preview of uh, what is actually under the thick white layer of restoration. Well, restoration is even the wrong r word. Masking is uh, more correct. Now one building survived in its uh, original form and uh, decoration, not exactly in uh, Moscow, but this is Dmitrysky uh, Sabor in the nearby city of Vladimir. And what is the official science telling us about this building? Oh, some foreigners came and built it, can't you see? It's in a Celtic or whatever style, it's not in local style. Well, that's the peak of shamelessness uh, because it is a uh, very same uh, style of uh, elements and also these uh, griffins and so on. This is exactly the style that is found uh, since the time of the Scythians on uh, their uh, golden items that I showed earlier in this uh, episode and it's also found in the rubble of Moscow and on all other artifacts of that time like, uh, for example, clothing, uh, state uh, symbols, 
etc. And it is essential to understand the seriousness of this problem. This is not a problem local to Russia. Russia is just one of the examples of what people found after they were alerted that their history is being uh, stolen and uh, they just started looking around. For example, in my documentary called The Planet of uh, the Megaliths, I show footage from Brighton Beach in New York and there is a column a European antique style looking column amongst the rubble of uh, some sort of a gigantic megalithic uh, city it seems because from what I last understand this uh, uh, pile goes on for at least 200 kilometers. So I really hope that you are not uh, getting bored because of uh, too many of the examples I quote are from Russia. It's not uh, because there is more history in Russia, at least till now we have no reason to consider so. The point is that people got aware about it here first and everybody who follows in their steps will find the same thing in their own country. And uh, I hope that I can turn my new website megaliths.org org into some sort of international hub where such an information from uh, various enthusiastic researchers from all over the world will be um, gathered at one place so that we can um, uh, connect this uh, big puzzle as soon as possible of our real history because we know very little maybe one or two hundred years of uh, the mainstream history is uh, somewhat correct and the rest uh, requires serious revision and no wonder that we see stuff like this in just uh, normal villages famous with nothing in that region this is seriously megalithic Pyramids, Romaic style architecture, this shouldn't be there in case the official history was correct, and yet it is there. Supposedly, the stupid villagers living there didn't know what's uh, happening in uh, three villages away from theirs, so yet they knew what kind of pyramids they built in Nubia. Still, many questions are awaiting uh, their answer. For example, the um, Survivor style cities, the very last uh, wave that used some remnants of the technology of the survivors, they are there on all continents without exception. Now you see uh, a collection of uh, such uh, cities. And so the question is what kind of uh, coverings, co road cover, did they use? According to mainstream history, in the best uh, case scenario, in the most luxurious uh, case, you get uh, pavement, stones. But on the actual photographs, we see stones very rarely here. The stones turn into something else. What is that else? It has to be manufactured somehow. Do you see the smooth streets? No mud? No vehicles uh, that are um, getting stuck in, uh, let's say, uh, gravel, pebbles or something like that. There was some sort of very neat and efficient covering. And on the top of that, the streets uh, would uh, remain very well leveled and we don't see any... Uh, now this is an example of stone, really, but uh, that's very little all everything else is something else that doesn't form those uh, uh, beds where the vehicles tend to pass more that we see that even on the modern asphalt roads sometimes not always but sometimes and yet in the past they had some sort of uh, a very nice uh, idea of how to cover their roads and pay attention to the very si size of these uh, roads. They are so well planned. We see some dirt on the top but it's not uh, much. You cannot say that this is a mud road. Definitely it's not. So nowadays we have central planning. We are paying traffic engineers uh, social engineers and I don't know what else engineers and at the end we still get uh, stuck for hours in traffic jams 
and that is even in the newly built quarters of the cities. While people that we call less advanced than ourselves managed to make a much smarter layout of their roads, smarter and much more efficient. And at last I would like to show you some statues from the cemetery of the city of Lvov. This city has no mainstream history, just blank. They could not uh, find any way to explain how could thousands of ordinary people that uh, lived in a very ordinary place, this was not some uh, posh a rich center or a trade center or particularly rich area, how could these people afford such splendid statues for their graves? The cemetery is some uh, 300 uh, years old, I mean the oldest uh, graves, and all of these statues are cast out of cement better than our cement, because our buildings fall apart in 100 years or so. But even the very technique of uh, casting such uh, beautiful things out of cement shouldn't have been known to some remote province. And also why all these uh, Romaic elements of architecture and outfits? Officially, such uh, scenes should have been crossing the minds of uh, sculptors and artists in a different place, Western Europe, and in a completely different time. All these antique-looking columns and other architectural elements of uh, design are definitely cast out of cement in this case. And if people in this uh, deep province knew about uh, this uh, technique, then why not uh, suggest that it was used everywhere else where this uh, Romaic style of architecture is prevalent? After having a look and uh, even also taking some uh, samples from some European stone castles, they don't look so much stone to me at all anymore. I don't know if I will find time to uh, publish that research in a video, but I also actually asked the, the descendants of the very people who built the castles, and they swear it up and down it's all done uh, by a quarried stone. Uh, I asked them if there is any proof, like a record or some sort of uh, sketches, plans of how it was built. No, everything has disappeared, as usual. Although they have every small uh, record of everything else, that is missing. And when I started asking many questions, they were like, well, what are you asking so much? There was no cement at that time anyway, so it cannot be built. Uh, using casting technology, so that's their logic. They they uh, they are really convinced that it must be stone because they absolutely believe that there could have not been anything else. Also, in the planet of the megaliths, or maybe in the video of uh, the advanced ancient materials, I'm not sure which one exactly. I show some images uh, from those uh, amazing uh, old uh, churches in Armenia. They are also relevant to the topics in uh, this episode because uh, they show polygonal masonry, megalithic, and also some uh, things that suggest casting. And on the top of that we see the griffins and all the other um, uh, elements that uh, we saw earlier uh, that were uh, under uh, in the ruins of uh, Moscow. And that the building of the Dmitrievsky Sabor that uh, survived and uh, 
historians, so-called historians, are telling us that some sort of Celts or Goths must have come to build it because it's in their style. It's uh, not their style, it's uh, the survivor's style. And when they find it in an area where it doesn't fit their uh, Goths and Celts labels, they just uh, bomb it or restore it or make up a funny story. It's time to find out our real history, I think. So far in the survivors episodes I have uh, presented uh, so much evidence that there is something very profoundly wrong with this so-called history of the textbooks that one would really need to wear blinders to still believe in uh, that so-called history. They come also um, in, in convenient designs for humans. So. Uh, don't don't you worry, you can get uh, ones that suit your personality. See, this is so cool and modern, not so bad. You see, this man is so happy and he's even watching the History Channel. You can get a retro design as well, maybe in genuine leather. But in case you like the newer channel, I would uh, just uh, like to give a small tip how to get emails uh, when uh, I upload new videos because that is no longer automatic. You can be subscribed, but you will not receive uh, uh, email updates uh, immediately as I post videos unless uh, you do this. Also, I still need uh, help with my latest project, the website megalits.org. The best uh, would be somebody who has experience with uh, PHP and interactive uh, maps to help me with the scripts. Or um, alternatively, if uh, somebody wants uh, to donate, the donation button is found again on the homepage of megalits.org and those money will go towards uh, maybe hiring a developer in case I don't find a volunteer. On uh, this uh, future website, megalits.org, I would uh, like to present systematically and hopefully on a map all the interesting uh, sites that I feature in my videos and many of them I haven't even uh, featured yet and yet tons of them are being sent to me daily by interested uh, YouTube uh, viewers. Some of them are precious, I can't even review them all, what to speak of uh, putting them in videos.